Tena koto te fano o Auckland Unitarian. Tena koto na manuhiri. No mai, hire mai, hire mai ki tene whare karakia. Ate atua. Good morning. Welcome to this space where for 116 years we have found spiritual sustenance to resist all that diminishes us. As over those years, we have resisted the exploitation of workers, resisted ignorance by offering education to those denied it. We have resisted colonial wars. We have resisted those who would violate our nuclear free zone. We have resisted racism. We have resisted those who oppress the rainbow community. We have resisted the exploitation of immigrants. We have resisted those who would destroy the environment. We have resisted the domination of one faith over others. We have resisted the forces of neoliberal capitalism that wind the gap between rich and poor. And most recently resisted hate speech that would divide us. Resistance is not the easy path, but in the age of Trump, a necessary one if we have any hope of realizing our seven principles. You're especially welcome this morning if you are a guest or visitor. Thank you for taking the chance to walk through our doors and give us your time. We hope you will find this a safe place to be who you are. We invite you to remain for morning tea. And I checked it out. It looks pretty sumptuous this morning. We consider it a part of our service. It is our sacrament of hospitality, and it won't be complete without you. I know we have I've advertised the topic for this sermon, a need to vent in the age of Trump. I found that a rather clumsy title, so I've changed it to Down the Rabbit Hole. That'll become clear as we go along, as will my opening reading, Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the boro groves and the mome wraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, th and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, kalu kalay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves and the mome wrath outgrabe. The flaming chalice was a symbol of resistance against oppressive forces during World War II. As we enter another week of uncertainty in the world, we light it to remember that there is only one side, that of humanity and planet Earth. May we pray for peace 
May we raise our voices and engage as we can in acts of resistance. And may we remember to take very good care of ourselves, each other, and of those we love. Many uh, observers of the age of Trump liken it to a, an Orwellian dystopia, a perfectly sound metaphor, I agree. However, I prefer another author. My father was a lover of words. The complete Oxford English Dictionary, or OED, was at his fingertips whenever he was writing articles, a book, or a lecture but also re readily but also readily at hand were the works of Lewis Carroll. This betrayed his belief that the OED did not give him enough words to be sufficiently creative. He was a practitioner of neologisms, neologism, the coining of new words. While still at high school, I once thought I'd tackle reading his master's thesis. Not able to get past the table of contents with any comprehension, I complained that I had never heard of half the words. He just smiled enigmatically and stunned me by saying, he created them. That's allowed, I protested in amazement. When Lewis Carroll first wrote Jabberwock, a nonsense poem that tells of a Beowulfian hero who is on a quest to face down a monster and returns home triumphant for the entertainment of children. I imagine he wore the same smile, for it is perhaps the most famous example of this linguistic art. Lewis Carroll made the English language verbal, cordial, gimbal, galumph, but far, by far the most useful to the contemporary situation is rabbit hole. Carroll did not, of course, invent the rabbit hole. That distinction belongs to the rabbits. But with the publication of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, he did turn those holes into something that people could fall down literally, in Alice's case, Figuratively, figuratively for the rest of us. That was in 1865. For most of the ensuing century and a half, the phrase maintained a modest profile, always present but far from omnipresent. You might say it just burbled along. But then, just as the primary season for the next president of the United States was beginning in 2016, a rabbit with red eyes wearing a white waistcoat consulted his pocket watch before scurrying off across the meadow, enticing us to follow out of curiosity. For this was no normal woodland creature. No, I wish it had been just a rabbit. It was a corrupt and repeatedly failed businessman and reality TV star, gifted at self-promotion and readily identifiable by his orange makeup small hands, and bad to pay, who rode down a golden escalator to announce to the world he was on a quest to lock up crooked Hillary, build a wall to keep out all the Mexican rapists, and to drain the swamp in Washington. The world was turned upside down. Like Alice, this was something we had never seen before, the most unlikely of unlikely candidates for president getting undue media attention. It was the Jabberwock, the monster, announcing he was to be the unlikely hero of the story. Politics had become entertainment. It was such absurd whimsy, beyond even Carol's imagination. And remember, he gave us talking caterpillars, narco narcoleptic dormice, and invisible cats. We had to follow never taking him seriously. And we did fall, right down the rabbit hole, where to our despair we have lived in a bizarre, disoriented, and disturbing alternative reality ever since. 
It is not all our fault. The rabbit hole, Carol described, was a figurative conduit to a fantastical world. But today, it is a metaphor for extreme distraction. Its transformation is an unintended consequence of the internet, which breeds rabbit holes faster than rabbits breed rabbits. And we fall in them all the time. You sit down to work, and remember you're going to look for a new jacket. Two and a half later, you have looked at hundreds. You place your order and refocus on work. And need to look up a specific fact. How many chiefs signed the treaty of white hanging? And hours later, you have compiled a staggering amount of information on the treaty's impact on contemporary New Zealand, none of which you need for your sermon. The day pretty much gone, you give one more go at your work, but a news notification comes up about your favorite basketball team. You go check out the score and see that Trump has done something more outlandish than he did yesterday. That leads to looking at subjects even further afield. The next thing you know, your partner has come home and asked what you did that day. Just research on my sermon, darling. (laughs) Then there are rabbit holes that are more like sinkholes. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The last being Trump's weapon of choice to keep us distracted. He is truly a master of distraction. He has journalists, political opponents, even his political enablers, and world leaders chasing their tails while he goes about destroying our confidence in capital T truth. The Washington Post counted up the number of lies he had said or tweeted in his first year in office. It came to 5.9 lies a day. While most journalists are busy trying to correct the record, Fox and conservative news websites use their outsized megaphones to echo his lies, no matter how egregious or outlandish. Trump and they understand, Trump and they understand that the untruths of his tweets does not matter as long as the base accepts them as true. Opinion trumps facts. As long as the country can agree can't agree on facts, it will never be able to reach consensus. Polarization suit their pursuit of power over truth, as his wedding the president of C with only 19% of eligible voters proves. Mishiko Kakutani, chief book critic at the New York Times, has an excellent article in the latest New Zealand Listener based on her new book, The Death of Truth. I recommend it to you. She lays out how the Trump rabbit hole seeks to assert power over truth. She says, Trump's incoherence, his twisted syntax, his reversals, his insincerity, his bad faith and inflammatory bombast is both emblematic of the chaos he creates and thrives on, as well as an ent- an essential instrument in his liar's toolkit. His interviews, off-teleprompter speeches, and tweets are a startling jumble of insults, exclamations, boasts, digressions, non-sequiturs, qualifications, exhortations, and innuendos. A bully's effort to intimidate, gaslight, polarize, and scapegoat. Precise words, like facts, mean little to Trump, as interpreters who struggle to translate his grammatical anarchy can attest. Within the chaos he foments with a bad, President Jabberwock, with jaws that bite and claws that catch, has assaulted democratic institutions and norms. The worst, in my opinion, is his attempt to destroy confidence in the media and replace it with his Fox News propaganda apparatus. But no less staggering are his attempts to undermine the justice system, civil and human rights, the intelligence agencies, the electoral system, 
environmental protections, and the civil servants who make the whole thing work. No less stunning is his consorting with authoritarian strongmen around the world, giving them some kind of legitimacy, while working to undermine the European Union and our ties to it through NATO. Daily, he makes the world less safe for democracy and more hostile to truth. Frankly, it's exhausting. Garry Kasparov, former world chess champion and leader of a pro a Russian pro democracy group, says that's the point. Propaganda exhausts your critical thinking to annihilate truth. Kakatatani points out how the sheer volume of lies, scandals, and shocks emitted by Trump, his Republican and neighbors, and media apparatchiks tend to overwhelm and numb people while simultaneously defining deviancy down and normalizing the unacceptable. Outrage gives way to outrage fatigue, which gives way to the sort of cynicism and weariness that empowers those disseminating the lie. In our exhaustion, we who are appalled by Trump are tempted to put all our hope in the Mueller investigation of Trump's likely collusion with Russia to win the last election and obstruct justice. Yet it is magical belief, thinking to believe that it could possibly lead to his impeachment. Even if the midterm elections produce a blue wave where Democrats take one or both houses of Congress, I predict that he will not be impeached. There is already a full-on attempt to discredit Mueller's investigation with lies to Trump's faithful. That will be extended to Congress if it attempts to remove him from office, as Congress is already held in low opinion by perhaps a majority of Americans. Congress is not going to risk taking actions that could lead to further polarization. Igniting a second civil war does not seem too far-fetched. The most we can hope for is that a Democratic Congress would stymie the worst of his abuses and attempts to destroy the social contract. Besides, even if the House of Representatives actually impeached the Jabberwock and the Senate convicted him, we would be left with the frubious bandersnatch, Mike Pence. I know I paint a dark picture. It's going to be a long slog ahead of us. We're going to have to pace ourselves, attend to the good it is in our power to effect, and pay attention to where the rabbit holes are. It may be decades before we can take the head of the Jabberwock and go galumphing home to the warm embrace of truth and reason. But no matter where we live in the world, this is our task for the foreseeable future. We cannot hope a Beowulf will come along to save us. It is going to take everyone who values freedom, truth, democracy, and the worth of every person. But I trust someday our quest will succeed, and we will chortle in joy, O frabjous day, kalu, kalu. For our meditation, get comfortable, and then consider these three questions. What did you just hear? What do you feel? How can we resist?
We actually have a few minutes. I'm wondering. We'll come back to that. <laughs> this is a notice. This is just wondering if anyone cares to share their eternal answers to those three questions. But you've clarified the question considerably. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have to watch carefully that we don't become fatigued by the whole thing and continue to engage with what is happening by reading and watching and trying to seek truth rather than fake information and yeah, resist where we can. I love the way Michelle Wolf, the American comedian, spoke at the White House press conference this year to all the White House press. She said, you say you hate him, I think you love him. <laughs> That's right. And the thing is, I'm always amazed at how the, the man is able to dominate the world media every day and how much they're getting out of it because it gives them endless time and exposure for speculating, thinking, talking about him. It's just been a feast for them. Yeah. 32 years ago, people asked why I had moved to New Zealand. No one does anymore. <laughs> I've just returned from a month in Trump land and I was in Washington DC for a short time and I thought what an amazing city of history and um, how much pride there is and how could this city actually embrace, which it doesn't of course, um, its president. But I was particularly heartened by the fact that spread throughout the yards of the houses in Washington, D.C., are quotes of Martin Luther King, pictures of which I took every one of them. Um, but, sorry, I'll just read my favorite. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Yeah, Clay, I, I have to confess to having been angry and annoyed that you were bringing Trump into this sacred place. And I, I, I make an effort to avoid paying attention to his tweets and, and came to New Zealand so that I would be able to live in a civil society. Uh, what I'm encouraged by, however, is the, the phenomenon of the, the states really kind of follow California. And, and you know, what happened in California even with Schwarzenegger as, as governor, was eventually the House became so overwhelmingly democratic that the, the democratic um, uh, solutions, he had to, to play along. And, and I think it, it may ultimately, after the midterms or, or even the next election, when if the balance of power shifts, as it did in California, uh, towards uh, a, a more liberal uh, well, you know, we have, even have socialists who are, are running for office in, in the states now as well, so we'll see. Unfortunately, John, I'm a bit more cynical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think what we're seeing now is what's been happening for 30 odd years in America, and I think it's almost like history repeating itself, and all we need is Trump to ride his white horse into the Senate. One of the things that's a problem, I think, is Trump is an, an American problem. He's a world problem. And, you know, you look at what's happening in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, Hungary, you know, various places where the alt-right uh, is getting or power and strength, and they feed off Trump and his tweets. Um, we just have to 
you were here for last week's diatribe against Australia, you know that they're certainly swallowing a lot of Trump stuff. So we can't, right now we can feel pretty good about ourselves. Uh, but we have to remain vigilant, stay out of the rabbit holes. I know for myself, uh, most of you know, we recently moved to New Zealand to escape Trump. Um, but it can be very discouraging, and it often felt, it still feels, like no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. Um, and there's a quote by Eli um, Weisel, and he said, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And for me, that means... Even if I cannot change something, and some things are bigger than any one individual to change, it matters that we stand up, and it matters that our, we make our voices heard. Well, I guess one thought that came to, to my mind, and I've been thinking this for a while, is about that you know, last 30 years, last few hundred years, that what has, the biggest thing that Trump has given to the world has been um, that, and I was disappointed to realize this myself, that I thought things were getting better, and then it was really just that the plaster over the horrible things had just gotten a little thicker, um, so that all of this hatred and racism and xenophobia that I thought the U.S. was finally growing out of was still there. We just needed somebody as horrible as Trump for the people who felt that way to think it was okay to be out in the open again. So we're back to the Klan days. And that is just horrifying. Well, after I to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I have started coming to the Unitarian Church is mainly because of Trump, believe it or not. I've been attending a Baptist church in uh, Manukau. Manukau is a fairly um, conservative area. And uh, much as I love the people there and the people I work with, we have socioeconomic depression. We have a lot of um, factors there that uh, mean that very, um, you do get that polarization of, uh, shall we say, conservative views and a tendency towards conservative religion. And although the Baptist church had been a very nurturing place for me, it's interesting how Trump came in. And the views that some of the people expressed within my church were enough to make me think, I can't stay here any longer. Um, so as you say, the plaster just had got thick. Um, but underneath, there was this core of racialist um, elitism, as well, and uh, you know, if you've got a bit of money, uh, let's go. And people were actually pro Trump and saying these sorts of things. And um, when you start reading that with people that you have been fellowshipping with, it actually hurts, and you just can't stay there if your heart is is um, much more open to, particularly to um, the gay community and to people of a different ethnic basis. For your comment? All right, you can. Um, I agree. Okay, I agree with everything that people have said, but I think we've got to be careful in New Zealand not to be complacent and feel that we're actually a little bit better. Um, Taika Waititi recently said how much racism he had endured, and uh, there were quite a few white people said, "What? What racism?" Well, hey. Well, that's why. Here in New Zealand, I'll do a sermon on Trump. Thank you all. For my closing words, I have selected some words by a man, Sean Parker Dennison. Many years ago, I met Sean as he finished transitioning to a man and 
it was fairly fresh out of seminary, and uh, but with great courage, accepted a call as a trans man in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I know. Close your mouth. <laughs> um, he's a brilliant, lovely person, and I want to honor how he's put his life out there. Spirit of justice, help us be courageous and committed in these times. Let us transform our ideals into actions, our words into deeds. Let the fire of our passion burn with both light and warmth. In our anger, help us embody the spirit of creative destruction, always making room for more justice, more compassion, more love. May it be so. May we be the ones that make it so.